Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I want to welcome you to the Epstein Project podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking about the recent events surrounding Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, and it's just, it's crazy. Um, as, as you know, there was a new victim uh, in the federal lawsuit against her. In addition to which, there's another lawsuit filed against Epstein's estate, which names Maxwell. Um, And so we're going to discuss both of those. I'm going to start with the recent developments in the ongoing case. And then if time permits, I will discuss case number two. If for some reason we don't have time for case number two, I will cover that in a separate uh, episode. Okay, so so I'm going to be bouncing around here. I kind of want to just go back to the lawsuit. And so for minor victim number four, it extends the time uh, that Ghislaine Maxwell has been sort of like pin pigeoned into, right? So initially it was just a three-year period, 1994 to 1997. And suddenly we have 2001 where she met victim number four who was a minor um so and and this is the first time that she has been charged with actual trafficking which um was not part of the original charges so obviously galane's attorneys um have sent motions to the court uh basically stating that they want to now uh, file an extension so that the case was originally supposed to be heard on July 12th. And they're looking to postpone that, claiming that they need more time because of this new uh, victim stepping forward. So I want to um, go over and review the the basic lawsuit. Uh, So let me just... Okay, so for, so for, let's see, so victim, minor victim, I mean, so like, generally, I'm going to take a step back. So it says that beginning in at least 1994, Glenn Maxwell enticed and groomed multiple minor girls to engage in sex acts with Jeffrey Epstein through a variety of means and methods, including but not limited to, you know, befriending them uh, prior to their, their, the abuse, the sexual abuse, befriending their families, uh, talking about their lives, showing interest in, in, you know, what's happening with you. And as we all know, because we've all been teenagers and we've all been young girls, uh, when an older sophisticated, worldly, wealthy woman is paying attention to you, that's, that's very flattering. And um, so it's a very seductive thing to do to, to children. I mean, essentially, the, these are children. Uh, she would um, t- talk about their schools, their families. So she would get to know them. And by getting to know about somebody's family, and getting to know about their habits, you know, there's information there that in Ghislaine's case, she used to um, her advantage in later threatening victims. So that um, it also says that Maxwell and, and Epstein would spend time building their friendships. So basically grooming these girls, taking them to the movies or taking them shopping, spending time together with them. And then... Having developed a rapport, Ghislaine Maxwell would try to normalize the sexual abuse uh, by discussing sexual topics, undressing in front of the victim, being present when the minor victim was undressed, and or being present for sex acts involving the minor victim and Epstein. So it, it goes on to add Maxwell's presence during minor victim's interaction with Epstein 
including where minor victim was undressed or that involved sex acts with Epstein, helped put the victims at ease because an adult woman was present. So in some cases, Maxwell would massage Epstein in front of the minor victim. In other cases, Maxwell encouraged minor victims to provide massages to Epstein, including sexualized massages. And, and many of those resulted in Epstein sexually abusing the victims. They also, you know, they, they used every trick to um, just groom these children uh, to be very, very susceptible uh, to their requests. So they would offer to pay for their travel and or educational opportunities. She would, you know, Maxwell, they acted like, you know, I guess you can say it's good cop, bad cop. You know, Epstein maybe would make an invitation and Maxwell would be right there saying, you know, you should do it because it's a good idea. And, you know, you could become X, Y, or Z or achieve your dreams. Um, so, I mean, this was definitely, definitely a Bonnie and Clyde, which is why I named my book, one of my books, Bonnie's Clyde. Uh, the true story of Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein, because they really, really acted like Bonnie and Clyde um, of the sex, sex demons of hell. So um, it goes on to say that between approximately in or about 1994 and in or about 2004, so now you see it's it's been pushed forward into time. It, initially, it was just 1994 through 1997. With victim number four, now it's pushed this wider into 2004, um, that she facilitated Jeffrey Epstein's access to minor victims by, among other things, inducing and enticing, aiding and abetting uh, the multiple victims. They were groomed, they were abused at multiple locations. So it lists the places where they were groomed and or abused. It does list the multi-story private residence on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, owned by Jeffrey Epstein, but I do want to add here that that's the largest private home in all of New York City. It's um a very desirable location. It's the house that Leslie Wexner gave to Jeffrey Epstein, fully furnished with multi-million dollar uh, paintings on the wall, fully stocked with all kinds of wine in the cellar. And and so he gave the, not only the house, but also the contents of the house, the, the antiques that were flown in from Europe, and again, like I said, you know, Picasso's and other grand masters that were used to decorate the home to Epstein for a dollar. A New York Times article from 1996, which, you know, I've, I've linked to many times on my Twitter, so you can find it on my Twitter. And for those of you who have Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, which was my first book on Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, and Leslie Wexner. Um, I, I do have the excerpt of that New York Times article that basically says that Wexner outfitted the bathroom as if it was James Bond, so that it had, you know, hidden cameras and it was lined with lead. And there was, there was, it was, it just went on and on so that when Wexner gave this property to Epstein, who we know was, had a room dedicated to cameras and surveillance and he was looking into every room in in the house and he was also looking into private areas like bathrooms so that by the time Wexner gave him the property in 1996 um it was fully sort sort of retrofitted with surveillance um and you know it what what gets me is, is is it's it's never really described Wexner's role is never described. It's one thing that I'm hoping that if there is a trial that Wexner's name comes up 
So anyway, it goes on to say um, an, uh, an estate in Palm Beach, Florida, used by Epstein, the Palm Beach residence. And again, this is a, a piece of property that Epstein was able to buy by monies that were sort of came into his account, but because there was a, an exchange of property, so they, they had Wexner and Epstein had an exchange of property scenario where Wexner would give Jeffrey Epstein a piece of property, like in, in Ohio, he had given him actually two pieces of property for very little money. And then Epstein would turn around at some point and sell this property to to Leslie Wexner for an incredible amount of money. And then Epstein would turn around and buy. Uh, this is how he purchased the Palm Beach Mansion. And it's also, frankly, how he purchased the island, the first island. Okay, and then it goes on to say that he, they that Ghislaine also um, did this um, at Jeffrey Epstein's Santa Fe, New Mexico ranch, uh, the New Mexico resident. And we all know it as the Zorro Ranch, which is what Jeffrey Epstein named it after the Zorro television show from when he was a kid. He liked Zorro, so he named it Zorro. And then this is interesting because it goes on to add Maxwell's personal, personal residence in England. You know, it's fascinating because this, you know, could very well open the door to Prince Andrew, which would be amazing. I doubt that this will happen because uh, there was a, a situation in one of the depositions and frankly, in front of one of the judges, I believe it was perhaps one of the first judges, where the connection to Prince Andrew, and it, of course, it, it, it had to do with Virginia Giuffray, the connection with Prince Andrew was brought up and the judge immediately struck that from the record, calling it, I think it was a word that was perhaps more devastating to hear than the word irrelevant. So I don't have that in front of me. So they didn't allow any information to come into the court system uh, about Prince Andrew. And, and, you know, that's, look, I mean, there are so many red flags around the case of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, that I think it's it's hard uh, not to see this for what it is, you know, an ongoing cover-up. But before I get too distracted, let me go back to the lawsuit here. So, it goes on to show how uh, sometimes Ghislaine or somebody working with Ghislaine would call the victims up to show up for the massage um, and that um, when they arrived at one of the houses, they would be greeted either by one of Epstein's employees or by Ghislaine Maxwell themselves. Um, and, you know, it goes on to really say that Ghislaine Maxwell facilitated Jeffrey Epstein's access, um, which resulted in the sexual assault. Now, it's really, it, it, it gets a little bit graphic, so I'm not going to do that um, because it's just, you know, I, I think that there are ways that you can look for the document online, but I don't think we have to sexualize this and victimize the victims, you know, more than the stress that they're going through currently. So, um, regarding victim number one, uh, M Maxwell and Epstein attempted to befriend victim number one um, by taking her to the movies, taking her on shopping trips. And, you know, basically she did her, you know, asking her about school, her classes, her family, and other aspects of her life. And Maxwell then sought to normalize inappropriate and abusive conduct by, you know, undressing in front of minor victim one and being present when minor victim one undressed in front of Epstein. It says that within the first year after Maxwell and Epstein met minor victim one, 
Epstein began abusing minor victim one. Maxwell was present for and was involved in some of this abuse. It went on to say that uh, Maxwell, so it was like group sex. I mean, basically I'm gonna leave it there that you know, it was Maxwell and the victim together with Epstein, which we've heard um, from reading uh, some of the court documents that in fact, I mean, I don't think I have to even remind you that um, the island, Little St. James, was known as Pedophile Island, and it was known as Orgy Island. So, you know, I mean, and, and his airplane, the 727 that he also got from Leslie Wexner, was known as the Lolita Express. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, every time I think about how obvious everything was, it just upsets me uh, even more. Um, okay, so then it says Maxwell interacted with minor victim two on at least one occasion in or about 1996 at Epstein's residence in New Mexico, and that uh, minor victim two had flown into New Mexico from out of state at Epstein's invitation, and that while there, Maxwell and Epstein took minor victim two to a movie, and then Maxwell took her shopping. Also, she discussed her school, her classes, her family. She was only, you know, I think she was only 16 at the time, perhaps a little younger, but I think she was 16. And then in New Mexico, uh, that's when Maxwell began her efforts to groom minor victim two for abuse by Epstein. She provided her with an unsolicited massage, uh, during which time minor victim two was topless. And she also encouraged minor victim two to massage Epstein. So minor victim three, Maxwell groomed in London. Uh, so it would be at the same house where the incident, the alleged incident with Prince Andrew happened that involves Virginia. So she met her in London between 1994 and 1995. And uh, of course, you know, she was under the age of 18, so she was a, a minor. Uh, she again discussed, she groomed, she groomed her. She discussed her life, her family. She introduced minor victim three to Epstein and arranged for multiple interactions between minor victim three and Epstein. And she encouraged minor victim three to massage Epstein, knowing that Epstein would engage in sex acts during these massages. Um, so I'm going to just inter interrupt here for a minute and say that if you've been listening to Sean Atwood, and if you haven't, he's on He's on YouTube, you know, he's been talking about the Epstein case for a long time now. He re recently um, started to interview um, Matthew Steeples, who runs the Steeple Times. He's also on Twitter, and he's had him on the show for three times. Matthew's a very nice guy. Um, he said something during, I believe it was either the first or the second interview. I'll find it and I will include a link to that here where he says that in 1994, Ghislaine Maxwell's house was being staked out because uh, there was concern that it was being used as a brothel. Um, so if you listen to Matthew uh, tell this story, he says that the neighbor right across the way that the FBI, the equivalent of the FBI, the authorities in, in London showed up and basically said, hey, we need to borrow your home. We need to use your room for about a week. And they kept tabs on the comings and goings of what appeared to be very young women. And it seemed to be apparently a lot of traffic and, and, you know, it, it was known that the house was being uh, monitored 
because they thought it was a, you know, a brothel. Well, after, after a week, nothing happened. And so Matthew surmises that, that it had to be Prince Andrew with some higher authority that interjected in that case. So we have a situation where Ghislaine could have been busted and put out of this trafficking business in 1994. 1994, that would have been before anyone ever discussed Epstein and Maxwell with any other authority. So in 1994, they had an opportunity to shut this down. In London, you know, I mean, come on, and she would have just been put in jail, and we would have not had her here in the United States, and she would have not harmed anybody else in the UK or any of the other victims that John Luc Brunel brought in from other countries. Uh, but no, they um they've known that she so she's been on their radar for sex trafficking since 1994. All right, I'm going to I'm going to continue. So minor victim 4 was recruited to provide Epstein with sexualized massages and was paid by Epstein or one of his associates including at times Ghislaine Maxwell herself. Um and she did this at the Palm Beach residence. Uh Maxwell met minor victim 4 at Epstein's Palm Beach residence when minor victim 4 was approximately 14 years old. And then it goes on to say that Maxwell interacted with minor victim four on multiple occasions at Epstein's Palm Beach residence, knowing that she was a minor. And these interactions took place between 2001 and 2004. It goes on to state that Maxwell groomed minor victim four to engage in sex acts with Epstein multiple times. Well, and then it goes on to say that, you know, again, she groomed her. She she wanted to know about her family, other aspects of her life. She went on to normalize inappropriate and abusive conduct. She went on to discuss sexual topics in front of victim four and being present when victim four was nude in the massage room of the Palm Beach residence. And then it goes on to say that on multiple occasions between approximately 2001 and 2004, minor victim four provided nude massages to Epstein. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's just, it, it's, it's really terrible to just know that this was going on literally in one of the wealthiest places. And, and frankly, all of these places are in, in very wealthy posh parts so that the um palm beach estate is in the wealthiest enclave of florida that's where the families of the early industrialists used to buy their mansions the kennedys bought their getaway house in palm beach palm beach has been basically the playground of the rich, rich and famous and powerful for a very long time. And this is going on in their backyard. And typically, they'll accept the people that sort of live the world of the very wealthy in Palm Beach, uh, these uber wealthy families that go back for generations. So it's old money. They'll accept some gossip, meaning they 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 turn a blind eye or they just whisper into each other's ear if it's somebody is out having an affair with somebody else they'll talk about that but this was outrageous now i'm going to take another detour because i know that one of jeffrey epstein's neighbors became very distressed because she claimed to someone that I'm not going to mention his name right now, but I'll probably mention it at another time. Let me just turn this off. Um, let me just turn the whole thing off so it doesn't ring again. So, one of Jeffrey Epstein's neighbors in Palm Beach be, did become concerned because according to what she told 
this person who she then tried to get involved because she was alarmed she she may or may not it, what he is not 100% sure about is whether or not this woman had a you know sort of an affair with Epstein um it seems that perhaps she did because she was able to describe the egg shaped um uh, you know, member, uh, that's the word I'm going to use. Uh, but she also said that she saw girls that were as young as 12 going into the Palm Beach mansion. So that it, it got, I guess my point is that it got so blatant that even though his house was at, at a cul-de-sac, so it reached at the very end of this narrow little strip of land um and really it's like it's a narrow little strip of land it's surrounded by water and you have houses large estates uh at either end of the road so his was at the very end at, at a cul-de-sac one of the older houses currently is being torn down because it's been purchased and someone is is building a new property on that and but really it was an old house anyway it was just it had been neglected for Epstein's purpose I suppose it worked out it did have a swimming pool you know it was it was a couple of minutes away from Mar-a-Lago uh, but but people you know people had to know what was going on and I, I know that I hear a lot of talk on Twitter regarding why didn't anybody say something i think it's pretty clear people have been quote saying something end quote since 1994 and and frankly i've heard grown you know like things since that there was talk about Ghislaine and epstein's uh behavior as early as 1989 as far as inappropriate sexual behavior um but I'll go back, you know, the article that came out in Cosmopolitan about Jeffrey Epstein when he was named Bachelor of the Year, or, or you know, like they would have, Cosmopolitan had this thing, which was, they would have like, oh, Bachelor of the Month, I think it was Bachelor of the Month. And so I think Epstein became Bachelor of the Month in 1980. 1980 is a year before he left. Bear Stearns, and um, I'll I'll discuss that in a separate episode of the Epstein Project podcast. But at that time, uh, the woman that he met, uh, it, it was sort of like an ad for rich single men, and um, this woman, I think her name was uh, Lisa. I'm, I won't mention her last name right now. So Lisa answered the ad and had a couple of conversations with Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, she was working a part-time job as a receptionist at an office downtown. And during one of those conversations, at, at least the last, the third conversation, which ended uh, up to be the last time she ever spoke with him, he was very inappropriate with her on the phone. He, he, he immediately turned... Uh, it, the charm into sort of a sexual assault on the phone, asking her really inappropriate questions. So as early as 1981, uh, there was there were red flags around his behavior. But we see that if we go back to his days at Dalton High School, he got into trouble uh, for being too close to one of the students. And, you know, Dalton is a place where I believe Dalton is elementary school all the way through high school. This is where the children of the rich, the famous, and the powerful, the Wall Street power brokers send their children to this school. However, this is where Alan Ace Greenberg connects with Jeffrey Epstein because Epstein is tutoring his son and offers him a job and of course Epstein is also dating his daughter so it doesn't hurt that he's got the son and the daughter of perhaps um 
the, you know, one of the only men who might have given him a break. It was an all, like a sort of like a one of the early Jewish firms. Um, there had been a lot of discrimination prior to the time that uh, Bear Stearns was created. Uh, Bear Stearns has some connections. Yeah, I have this in my books. I believe that the Bear Stearns, I really go into it in, in um, Bonnie's Clyde, the true story of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. So those connections already were, were connecting back to Leslie, Leslie Wexner, Edgar Brofman. Those connections go on to then connect to Roy Cohn, who then connects in the future to Donald Trump, who he met in the 19, 1980s. Uh, when he was building uh, Trump Tower. Um, and then, of course, it, it connects to, I mean, there are just all these connections that can go sort of in circles at Bear Stearns. And in any event, I'm going to, I'm just going to get back to this lawsuit. Um, so, I mean, okay, it goes on to say that you know, she assisted with some of the travel. And um, so the way that Ghislaine Maxwell's attorneys are handling this now is they are claiming that, oh, well, this is unexpected. And um, they are saying that her health is declining. What a surprise. Like, we didn't see that coming. Uh, they claim that uh, there's no way that they can be ready for a July 12th proceeding. Well, you know, I want to say and I want to remind everyone that she's got the most powerful attorneys that money can buy. And, and, and there are like many of them. Um, and if you look at their connections, which I have on my Twitter account, um, those are pretty um, interesting connections her attorneys have to previous cases. So the fact that they're stating this um, means, well, obviously, they have attempted to present day to try to get her released on bail. They've tried three times. They have failed three times. They've also attempted to say... Um, that all the charges should be dropped. I think that happened concurrent with the third request for bail. Judge didn't buy that either. The charges should not be dropped. But I want to remind everyone that uh, these people were in the business of spying. And um, if you remember when Jeffrey Epstein was arrested on June 6 of 20, I'm sorry, July 6 of 2019, you'll know that he was in Paris. He flew into Teterboro, New Jersey, whereupon he was arrested. However, he was tipped off. He knew he was going to be arrested, but he believed that he would just, you know, be able to skate by this. He had skated by in 2008. He did have a non-prosecution agreement that the federal government gave him, as well as giving it to co-conspirators. Co and he believed nothing was going to happen to him. Um, he got tipped off when the police were ready to raid his uh, Palm Beach mansion. And he was able to remove a lot of the hardware that would have had the tapes and, and devices for, you know, with camera equipment and listening devices. He was able to do that so that these people are in the business of spying. I mean, we've got Glenn Maxwell, who was the daughter of Robert Maxwell, who is considered a Mossad's super spy. So if you haven't read... Uh, Robert Maxwell, <laughs> Super Spy by Gordon Thomas and Martin Dillon. I, I suggest you read that. It's a fascinating read. 
uh, it, it takes you into the world of, um, it's really about how, how the Mossad planned and killed Robert Maxwell, but it shows you how they work. So in my opinion, based on the fact that this is a family that is very privy to how to spy, I believe Ghislaine Maxwell had pre-knowledge of this new lawsuit, this new victim number four that has been added to the government's uh, case against her. And this is why they were trying desperately, again, in my opinion, to get her released from jail. I believe that had she been released on for any reason, she would have fled the country because the charges are becoming more serious. Um, we also know that there's a new lawsuit by a woman in Florida who was 26 years old at the time that she was befriended by Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. She was a real estate agent showing property to Jeffrey Epstein. She had an eight-year-old kid. Um, and this, you know, I don't know that I can get into this, the long form of this. I'll discuss that separately, but I will say that it's, it's if you read that lawsuit, which I attached to my Patreon account, and also I have it on my Twitter threads, it's just, it's, it's, um, it, it takes it to a new level of just horror. Uh, they enticed her, offered her a job. She was trained in, in, in being a hair cutter. So she cut Epstein's hair and from cutting Epstein's hair that turned into a sexual assault. Um, when she said she was going to call the police, well, Ghislaine Maxwell turned around and said, I'll call the police. She dialed the police. Apparently, two police officers showed up and threatened the woman uh, with putting her in jail for prostitution. Th that's a terrifying thing. So the police come, and they're not going to help her. Instead, they're going to arrest her. So Ghislaine and Epstein tell the police to go away. They put this woman in the car. They take her to her house. They pick up her eight-year-old son. They drive to the alligator lake i forget the the name of the alligator spot but this is a, a body of water where there are a lot of alligators they basically tell her that if you tell anyone about what happened we are going to throw you in there and we're going to feed you to the alligators and and they, they made it clear to her that they had done this to other victims and so she was terrified, and then they took her to a hotel, her and her eight-year-old son, whereupon they proceeded to rape her in front of her eight-year-old son. Now, if that is not chilling, these events are not, this takes it to a whole new level of evil. Um, so, okay, we, I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm going to say this. Um... They're trying, the, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's attorneys are trying to portray Maxwell as though she is getting uh, sicker every day. She's getting weaker every day. So this can only really go in, in, in one direction. She becomes another, another Harvey Weinstein. She starts off healthy. And at some point, like they're already telling us, she's not doing very well. She's going to be incoherent. By the time she gets to her trial, which might be pushed further than July 12th, which is when we were expecting it, and then she'll be just a, a blathering it, idiot. And she won't be able to uh, correctly testify. She won't be able to correctly identify or discuss or, or, you know, be involved in her defense. I see that as one option. The other option I see is they will close the door private proceedings because the names are too explosive. I, I Again, I just have a hard time believing there's going to be a sincere trial. Um, they'll close the door like they did with El Chapo. It'll be a, a sort of, your, the public will not be allowed. And I think we'll never really know what happened. And even behind these, um, when it's done, closed away from the public, 
there's still a lot of games that are played, right? The truth, it doesn't always come out in a court of law. Um, for many reasons, you know, there's just too many people that are compromised. Okay, so I'm going to end it here. And um, I just got a little message saying time is running out from uh, my Spreaker account. Okay, just please leave your questions, comments on the um, on the thing below, on the comment section below. Um, Every day, there's just new information that we're allowed to see. It's just this is unprecedented. You know, this really is. I'm going to call it the biggest cover up, the biggest spy case. Obviously, you're not going to get this from mainstream media. So once again, thank you for your support. You know, I've got all of my details down there. Consider following me on Patreon through the end of the month. I do have a special. Uh, discount for anybody who wants to buy my books and or wants to become part of the Epstein Project uh, newsletter. And, um, you know, continue to follow uh, Sean Adwood on his YouTube. He, he does have people on uh, that give a good insight about Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein and Leslie Wexner, as well as Ryan Dawson. And if you're not, and, and Ryan Dawson, as you know, has been a deep platformed many times, so you can find him. I'll try to keep a link down here somewhere for you guys to find Ryan. And also start following Matthew Steeples uh, for the, from the Steeple Times, as well as uh, Kai Zenbickle, who is um, Peter Nygaard's estranged son. And he's working very, very hard to make sure that Peter Nygaard is kept behind bars. So, all right. I catch you guys uh, next time. And um, all right. Thank you for listening. Bye.